Welcome to Ranger Rob Has Your Back, a show that features your business, your services, your products. On Ranger Rob Has Your Back, you are the star. Let Ranger Rob be your advocate. Let's get started. Hi guys, this is Rob from Ranger Rob Has Your Back, and this is part two of talking about being a visionary. <laughs> and so in part one, I talked about being a visionary when you're young and the craziness of having a, a mind that just goes, explodes with ideas and just, you just can't, can't wait to start thing, things and build it up and the whole works. Well, after uh, the twenties, <laughs> my twenties, uh, and I started realizing I was putting all this great energy to things that were good and good for the community and all that kind of stuff. But it was getting time that, um, and of course, having a father going, why are you wasting your time with all this when you should be focusing on careers? And he was right. Didn't believe him at the time, but he was right. So uh, I did get out of the community kind of stuff and uh, focused on my career in an aerospace company. And so I, I got hired on as a wire assembler, and I uh, was an hourly guy. And um, and you got to remember, thirty years of working in an aerospace company, you get laid off a lot, and then you get pu pulled back on, and you get laid off, and and the longer you get time because the unions and stuff, the the sooner, um, the least, then that doesn't happen as often. But anyway, uh, as I uh, put in my um, first year or so, I just worked real hard and did my thing, realized that uh, if I go beyond my means and stuff like that, I'd have union people mad at me. <laughs> Not a good thing to do to a visionary. Um, and then uh, when I was laid off for the first time, uh, I pretty much kind of um, hung out with the kids. My kids were brand, you know, just born and whole work. So I got to be, I got to be with my kids during some um, precious times. And then I got back on there again and the whole work. So we're really talking about the 90s now or, or late. Uh, well, no, we're talking about mid 80s going into the 90s. So with the drive that I have and and, and, and the fact that I had a father that was a director and, um, and a manager, I really looked up at him. And of course, uh, I didn't have the education he did, but I was determined to get into management. So when you're in the aerospace <laughs> industry and you're striving to move forward uh, and you want to stand out a little bit. Um, you know, I did, I read and went to every night school, everything I do, learn more electronics, learn fiber optics. And I actually, eventually I got upgraded to um, a higher standard and then I got hired to what they call a working lead and then uh, eventually a lead. And in uh, 1987, um, I had a supervisor. I was driving him crazy. And, and by the way, by, back then, they used to tell you to look the part. So I'd be the only one in the shop actually working in a shop, electronics, and actually wear slacks and a nice shirt every day because they say back in those days, you got people have to look at you and say, you look the part. And yeah, I'm going to have dogs in the background. I'm being nice to them a little play. So anyway, uh, uh, so one of the main things that this company is you want to get in what's called pre-management class and you have to get a recommendation from your supervisor. And I was like pulling teeth. Um, and I worked on it and I worked on it. Finally, finally, I got him to agree <laughs> and I went and I got that certification. And then uh, uh, it was not much time after that. I uh, applied for being an instructor uh, at, at a different location, which is a management position at the time, and actually got into management at age 27, 20, 26 or 7. And uh, uh, and that was my full-pledged um, visionary kind of lifestyle, just like I can see myself there, I'm going to get there, and the problem is people around you will go, oh my gosh, you're driving me crazy. So I either made it up to management because I was driving people crazy or, you know, I just had to drive. I was going to do it. And uh, I did it. And eventually after teaching, we taught a lot of electronics people and we sent them to wire shops and stuff. And then we trained some more and some wire shops. Well, you know, uh, when things get rough again and there's a dial cycle, the first thing that goes is instructors. 
Well, luckily, one of the shops that really liked the people I was instructing, um, the uh, general there hired me as a supervisor over the wire shops at the same place I started in many years before that. So it was like big circle. <laughs> anyway, um, and uh, in between that and around 82, um, I, on a personal note, I, I, uh, I got into kite flying. I know this is crazy, but it's the stunt kites. And I, I saw a video of these guys with stunt kites doing maneuvers in the air to music and stuff like that. And I thought that was the coolest damn thing in the world. This was on the personal side of life. So, you know, I, you know, long story short, got some of my wife into kiting. I got into kiting. My neighbor got into kiting and we got, um, so eventually it was four of us and we're going to, and they call it stunt team stunt kite flying, which is the coolest thing in the world. It's like, it was a great excuse to go to the beach a lot. The kids loved it. And we got pretty good at it. And, and, and then we decided that we'd get into some kite competitions. And so uh, we actually called it the cutting edge kite team. And of course we do that for a year or so. And we traveled to all kinds of places like Seaside, Oregon, Newport, um, uh, California, you know, and, and competed and got, and we started out terrible, <laughs> but you know, me, go, 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 let's go like crazy. And uh, I probably drove the team members crazy, but they had a good time. And uh, um, over time, we actually became the, uh, uh, what they call AKC champions for uh, precision, precision flying in 92, I believe it was. Anyway, but one thing was like, okay, we're doing all this kiting thing. When you do these competitions, you don't win cash prizes or anything. And of course, I'm going, oh, why don't I, you know, maybe start selling kites? So sure enough, um, Boeing, I got laid off. So it's like, okay, let's start a business. So I started cutting edge kites uh, in Kent, Washington. And then I expanded it to a store in Ocean Shore. So we had one on the beach. And of course, I couldn't stop there. I did one in Everett, Washington, and one in Bellevue, Washington. And um, I can't say that that was my my best endeavors. Uh, retail store, by the way, suck. I would never do retail stores again. Um, two is that the product was limited to those people like kiting and maybe people like wind socks and flags. But um, in the early 90s, there was a big... Um, uh, flare of people wanting to do kite flying and and it was actually a dying uh, you know everybody went into it and then pretty soon people kind of started backing out of it so the trend was starting to go away so by 1995 i um the stores were just you know just barely hanging on so i actually um shut down two stores in the malls and i uh, sold those inventories to um, in the two stores I had one in Kent and one in Ocean Shores. I sold, and it was kind of like walking away from a burning building. <laughs> but wow, what a great experience that was! And, and boy, I I know what I don't want to do, and I learned some limitations like what I don't want to do in the future. So shortly after that, sure enough, I got hired back in the aerospace company, and I was back in there for a while. So in like '97, I uh, ended up getting. Uh, into an area that was just engineering support. And then with a year, I got hired as a manager again in the same wire shop that I ended up before. And uh, sure enough, things were getting tough again. And uh, um, actually it was just before, I, I got that a little wrong. I got hired doing the next endeavor, but in like 96 or 97, um, I was still, I was unemployed after I sold my company. and. Uh, I got hired as a project manager in Kent, Washington to do an annexation. Uh, cities back then were trying to expand to get their head counts higher in more regions so they get more tax dollars from the state. So they, they, they do what they call an annexation. And so uh, I got hired by the city of Kent. And so we did it internally and I actually did an annexation form and hired a couple of managers and uh, hired like 50, 60 uh, annexation counters and we pu pulled off and you have to have it done in 30 days. And we learned the process, worked with Olympia and uh, before you know it, we're done. And it was a big success and we actually did it under budget. So it was great. Project was over. It was kind of done. Well, it wasn't like a month later, I got contacted by a city official saying that we were recommended by uh, 
uh, Olympia, the state of Olympia, um, was <laughs> the state of Washington, Olympia is their capital. And uh, sure and heck, I got um, a call to say, can you do an annexation for another project, another city? And, but can you, and, and luckily I had my own, I still had my business license. So uh, it's like, okay, we'll do it on contract. So we bid out the contract and, uh, and so I did it independently and came in and hired people and I got paid a really large sum and I paid off everybody. Everybody made good money. And sure enough, I get called again. We did 11 annexations before uh, the year 2000. Um, and of course, by the year 2000, they do what they call the regular census. So by then everybody's numbers get better. So anyway, so during that time, I also got hired back at the aerospace company. So my last couple of annexations were a little harder to do because I was actually working nine to five too. And, um, but no biggie. So by 1999, um, uh, aerospace companies kind of going through another downturn. And I, 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 uh, I have um, actually started managing programmers. And that's when I discovered the internet. And that's why I actually met some programmers. And remember, everything was a lot different than it is today. And I actually learned how to make um, websites. And so um, just for fun of it, I, I come across a couple of people that I knew, and they said they wanted a, a website. And I made it for them, and they paid me for it. And I'm going, wow, this is a great business. So I kind of solicited a little more, started getting more. Pretty soon I was starting to get uh, maybe a dozen websites that we were doing for companies. Anyway, so downturn at the aerospace thing. This time I took a voluntary layoff, sold my house, moved to Oregon, and bought a five-acre place, a mini ranch, which my kids were teenagers by then. So you can just imagine my family's like, boy, it's hard to keep up with your dad. So anyway, uh, I get down there. We start this internet company called Cutting Edge Webs in Oregon, and it just skyrocketed. It's what I would call the best turnkey model business I've ever done after all the experiences I've gotten. Um, and, and once again, going back to all the things that were good and bad in the past from my visionary drive. And like I said, some were good. In the last video, I said some were good, some were bad. Anyway, this company, I decided to follow what they call E-Myth, which is create this company to be a turnkey operation. And so uh, I did. And uh, I, uh, we ran the company up to like 2003 and, uh, I kind of like, I was really on the top of my game. We had over 680 websites we were maintaining and, uh, you know, we made some mistakes here and there, but basically I was going, you know, we're really at the peak of my game and I'm going to learn this time to, to get out of the game while I'm ahead. So I put the company up for sale and within a few weeks, the company Canada goes, we'll buy it. And it's like, really? And there's a lot of things in between to make all that happen. But basically, we got a nice chunky check to walk away. And uh, um, I'm very proud of that. That was one of my greatest accomplishments. Once again, all of that was visionary. All of that was drive. All of that was in nuts, you know. But um, if you're a visionary, you know what I mean? Things are just your head's exploding all the time. And sometimes the people around you can hardly keep up. You got to have the right kind of people around you. But anyway, uh, um, that's kind of part of it. And I'm going to do a part three here because these videos can get kind of long and kind of go into the next part. Because after that, I couldn't go back into web design because, you, you know, when you sell a company, they don't want you going a non-compete thing for about two years. So I actually went into internet marketing, which was a whole different ballgame. And um, also, uh, just give you an idea what will be in the next video, we'll be talking about the opportunity to... Uh, you know, kids got older, went somewhat in the military. I always went, followed, you know, schooling. And also in that story I'm going to tell you about is when we moved to Oregon, um, we also got into, um, you know, we had five acres. Uh, with why I studied the kids around, we got into game birds. So we literally had a game bird ranch um, while we're doing all this. And that was a crazy endeavor. And I'm going to save that story for the next one too. So anyway, just going on this visionary um, path that I've had all my life. And for those of you who are, vi are visionaries, you totally understand what I'm talking about. It's like a, it's almost like a drug. And like I said, there'll be failures, but um, you need to make sure you're around people that understand your drive 
And also you allow them to talk to you to bring you down from your high. <laughs> that's what that's what visionaries are all about. So anyway, I hope this was kind of fun. Um, I am going to do a part three and uh, go into some other crazy things we did in our lives. And uh, I hope for those of you that, I mean, this day and age, I know it's hard for people to have drive in visions and stuff, especially the youngins when they're at home and they don't know what, and the COVID's keeping them home and all that stuff. Uh, they need to, if they've got that drive in them, you need to fill it, parents. <laughs> Let them chase their dreams. Let them chase their visions. And even if they fail, they got to do it. And when they fail, they're going to probably learn something. And so you got to let them fall. And uh, so that, that's kind of the two cents I'll put in for that. So I want to thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope you guys got a little bit out of that. Um, if you're a visionary, please leave comments below. I'd love to hear your comments. Or, you, uh, or you're married or you're, you have a friend that's a visionary. <laughs> Tell me your stories. They're funny, I know. Um, like I said, sometimes you feel like you have to give someone a depressant just to calm them down with all their ideas. And, but it's actually a really good thing. Um, it's a good thing that everybody's visionaries, by the way, <laughs> it'd be chaos. So anyway, guys, thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to like subscribe and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Be safe until next time. Have a great day. Bye everybody. Our videos are made possible by Ranger Rob poopy bags. Available at Amazon right now. Thank you very much for watching our video. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Thanks.